Hi everyone, and welcome to my presentation on using the IFS lens to include the autistic experience in therapeutic spaces. I'm so glad that you decided to attend today. So the flow of the presentation, it should take um, 45 to 50 minutes. Um, there's going to be a teaching piece around the clinical diagnostic criteria of autism, generally how it presents the things to look out for. And then we'll move into the IFS piece of um, how to use the model, what changes you might need to make, and maybe ways to adapt some of your thinking, things that you can look out for, um, and then we'll really focus on how beautifully it works with the autistic brain. So to begin, I just want to spend one minute with this beautiful quote from Rumi. There is one way of breathing that is full of shame and constriction. Then there is another way, a breath of love that takes you all the way to infinity. And I invite you to take a couple of breaths and set our intention today for breathing with love and open hearts and minds. So a little bit about me. I am autistic. Um, I was diagnosed in 2020 at the age of 50. Um, I have lived my entire life as an autistic person without a diagnosis up to that point. And so much of life really didn't make sense to me. So for me, receiving a diagnosis was very helpful in uh, identifying some of the reasons for behaviours and thoughts and difficulties and patterns, etc. And it's, it's actually really helped me a lot to receive a diagnosis, and I'm very, very comfortable with it now. I'm a wife and mother of three, including an autistic daughter. I'm a certified IFS level two practitioner, soon to be level three, and I have my own practice based in New Jersey. I see clients from all around the world, and I see clients of all neurologies, although I do specialize in working with people with autism, particularly um, adults who are newly diagnosed. And we work a lot on how to um, just sort of greet the autistic diagnosis and then how to take it out into the world as part of us and be really um, authentic with it. I'm a trained Pilates instructor, which is where I learned the um, somatic approach to emotions and experiences. Um, I love to use my hands. I um, have mirror synesthesia, so I feel what the other person or what the client is feeling a lot of the time, which actually really helps with my work, both as a Pilates instructor, which I no longer do, but now in my work as an IFS practitioner, it's very helpful. I'm a student at the Graduate Institute in Goddard College, and I'm writing my master's thesis, which is hopefully going to be a book um, on this very topic of including the autistic experience in therapy modalities, you know, all forms of therapy modalities. And I hold a certificate in autism studies from the Zio Institute. I come from a family of autistics, um, a brother, nephew, my own daughter, and my mother, who was actually an undiagnosed autistic her entire life. Um, at the age of 15, she was institutionalized in England and sent to an approved school, which was um, a school for delinquent people, delinquent women or girls in her, in her case. And that experience really shaped the outcome of the rest of her life. Um, and she remained undiagnosed and really struggled because of it. And so that really guides my uh, my work today. And this presentation is a labor of love and a way to honor her experience, the experience of myself, of my daughter and other autistic people, and to really reclaim the narrative around what autism is. So what is it? So it's a neurological developmental condition. And what it actually does, it is changes the shapes and the structures of the brain and how those structures communicate. Um, one of the things they found with brain scanning is that the amygdala can be um, slightly enlarged in people with autism. Um, and as brain imaging becomes more and more sophisticated, we'll definitely start to gather more information around that. It's the fastest growing developmental disability in the world. It's a spectrum, right? So rather than it being a linear spectrum, think of it as a color spectrum. So it's a circular spectrum 
where the traits and characteristics um, of the autistic experience are really shared by people on the spectrum, but to varying degrees. And context definitely plays a big part in how those traits and characteristics manifest. Um, I just want to say a couple of things about what autism isn't. Okay, so there are certainly some myths around it, one of which is that it, um, it affects males or only males. That's, that used to be what they think, they thought rather. And we now know that that's not the case. Um, the ratio is around three to one. But I do believe that as the diagnoses, as the uh, criteria pre changes and the context is is included in that, that we're going to see more of a, you know, moving towards more of a 50-50 split in terms of who it affects. It also affects people across um, all races and cultures as well at the same rate, although you are much less likely to be diagnosed with autism if you're female or a person of colour. It affects people um, on all, all um, lengths of the intellectual spectrum. So it's actually not a characteristic or a diagnostic criteria for autism, but it does affect intellect. And about 33% of people with autism will have will, will score low on the intellect scale so they'll have lower IQ so you don't have to have intellectual challenges or be um, a savant in order to have autism that, that it's almost like a co-occurring condition that happens with it um, a quick note about the term high functioning so it used to be used in conjunction with Asperger's right Hans Asperger's work around high functioning individuals and it's a term that we try not to use now because it's just not helpful. It doesn't really give us any information and it minimizes the experience of the person with autism and who gets to determine what is high functioning and what isn't. And again, it's keeping the, the idea of context in mind is really valuable. And then finally, autistic people can and do feel empathy. And we actually often feel empathy in overwhelming amounts. Um, so that's something else to, to consider. So a quick look at the diagnostic criteria. So this is pulled from the DSM-5, and there are two main categories, social communication and relationships and restricted and repetitive behaviors. So the first category, all three of those deficits need to be, um, need to, to be there in order for a diagnosis to be given. So that's deficits in social emotional reciprocity, which look reciprocity, excuse me, which looks like an unusual or social approach. So it could be talking a lot about a subject that's really interesting to you, but not to anybody else. It could be um, not knowing how to engage in social chit chat or small talk. It could be not knowing, not being able to read the cadence of sentences and conversation, um, which can lead to lots of interruptions. And that's something that I struggle with and I interrupt frequently in conversations, in particular with my husband. So that's something I'm working on. I'm conscious of that. It can be a failure to initiate and respond to social interactions. So whether or not you're invited to go to places, how easy is it for you to either initiate seeing other people socially or to receive an invitation to see other people socially? And that's uh, something else that I struggle with. And I'm sort of I've always struggled with that since I was a child. It's always been very hard for me. Um, and then the, one of the other things that can be is with the social emotional reciprocity is not being able to read what it looks like. And so there can be a lot of rehearsal that goes into situations. So for me, if I'm going to take an Uber, for example, I generally run through what that's going to look like when I open the door. What should I say? What might he say back to me? And a lot of those things, are, they can be very discreet. So you may not even be aware that the person you're with, or maybe perhaps it's yourself, that this is happening because you're not saying these things out loud. But it's just good to sort of keep your radar open to whether or not these things are actually happening. Nonverbal communicative behaviors are things like eye contact. That's the stereotypical one that people always land on. Most autistic people can make eye contact. Um, it's much easier to make eye contact with the person when they are talking and much less 
easy to make eye contact when you're the one doing the talking. So you'll often see that switch in eye contact when the conversation changes to, who, to whoever is talking. Um, it can also be body language and gestures and then issues with personal space, either becoming you know, upset or agitated if somebody is too close, or it can be not reading those boundaries and staying too close to another person. And then it's deficits in developing, maintaining and understanding relationships. So that means um, adjusting behaviours to social contexts. Can you engage in imaginative play? So can you um, imagine what that social engagement is going to look like with an imaginary character? It can be a decreased interest in peers um, and friendships. And then it can be a difficulty establishing maintaining and understanding relationships, whether that's friendships or romantic relationships, and including um, being able to sort of float on the waters of the regular ups and downs that happen in relationships. They can be very upsetting and disturbing to an autistic person because it's hard to read what the outcome is going to be. So the second grouping is restricted and repetitive behaviors. Um, so basically stereotyped repetitive movements. So you can think of um, rocking is a very common one that you'll see with people with autism, um, moving of the leg, tilting of the head, nodding, um, blinking, either very fast or very slow, sometimes grimacing. Um, You'll see in children, they'll often flap their hands. Um, I tend to do this, I run my fingers, my four fingers along my thumb, and I do it on both hands, mostly my right hand, and I'm doing it almost all of the time. But my hands are down and most people would never even know I was doing it. So again, these behaviors and these um, traits, you may not even realize that they're happening, right? So they're autistic people are really good at learning to be discreet where their autism is concerned. So one of the other criteria is insistence on sameness. And that basically means um, distresses at changes to the physical environment and routines, right? So if somebody comes in and moves or touches your things, if your routine gets adjusted in some way, especially short notice, that can be very challenging. Difficulties with transitions, and that can be going from place to place or from task to task. Um, liking to take the same route all the time. That's something I'm certainly, uh, I certainly do when I walk my dogs. I, we go the same way every time. Um, and eating the same foods because of whether it's because of color, texture, or flavor palette. So most autistic people have a fairly limited diet. Of course, you're always, I'm not speaking for everyone here on any level, but the commonality is that there are the limitations or the, the repetitive behaviors can also include food. And then the intense restricted or fixated interests. So it's again, pretty unusual to find an autistic person with a really wide range of interests. Um, it's much more common to have just a couple, perhaps even just one, but to have a very intense focus on them. So re you're really interested in the in the thing that you're really interested in, right? That's basically what it looks like. Switching from one thing to another um, is also common because it's hard to focus on more than one interest at a time. So your interests change. So perhaps the interest is, you know, birds, and then another time it might be, you know, dogs or something. But but keeping both of those in mind at the same time is going to be much more challenging for the autistic person. And interest, intense interests can also look like um, liking the same TV shows or movies or music and then playing the same thing over and over again. So listening to the same song 20 times. For me, it's TV shows. And in fact, during the course of um, working on and writing this presentation, I watched the uh, Netflix series Stranger Things, all four seasons um, from start to finish about five or six times. And I just love to have it on. I listen, I watch, and then I can work while I'm doing it because I know it so well, but it's very comforting to me. And it's certainly a very fixated interest that I have. And then the final one is hyper or hyper reactivity to sensory input. 
And this is one of the most common that you're going to see in that bottom section of, of four. Um, and that basically means that, that you either have an increased or a decreased sensitivity to sensory input. So there's something called the intense world theory that relates to four areas of over-functioning. And they are hyperperception, which means you're bombarded with sensory information, hyperattention, which can cause problems with executive function because you become very focused on one very small specific thing, hypermemory, which is something that's commonly thought of when you think of someone with autism, you know, the idea of being able to um, talk about statistics and data and, you know, scores in baseball games and those sorts of things. And then hyperemotionality, which is when emotional dysregulation takes place because of disturbances with routines or sensory input or perhaps something else in the list of criteria here. And then a quick note about the DSM-5, right? So the DSM-5 is a statistically driven evidence-based decision tree that uses decades old language to form the, the criteria and offer an outline of what autism looks like. But it's not the only viewpoint, and autism is certainly a not a one-size-fits-all condition. So these are a couple of quotes from sort of more recent um, creative thinkers. Janara Nerenberg is, a, is a, an autistic author. She has a great book called Divergent Mind. So along with the DSM criteria, there's also the heuristic um, way of learning and knowing right which is the lived experience so how do i know it's because i live it um, and that really creates a great window into what the autistic experience is like and the lived experience of what what it's like to be on the spectrum or be in relationship with somebody with autism whether it's a partner or a friend a child or a client it's a really great way to learn how autism presents So why is it important for you to know? I'm gonna move my little picture here. So in 2020, the CDC estimated that 2.2% of adults are on the spectrum. And I mentioned before that it's the fastest growing developmental disability in the world. So this makes it likely that you are currently working or have worked with an autistic client. And within that number of 2.2%, right? So they estimate that a quarter of school age children who are on the spectrum have not yet been diagnosed and about 10 percent of adults who are on the spectrum also haven't been diagnosed so again that sort of increases what you're looking at here so you may be working with a client who does know they're autistic but there's also a good likelihood that you're working with a client who doesn't yet realize that they're autistic and misdiagnoses are very common and they can include bipolar add trauma ptsd and bpd so if a client presents with some of those um, diagnoses and there are some co-occurrences there, then it's just worth sort of getting curious and maybe expanding the diagnostics to include the possibility that autism might be at play here. So many autistic people um, really feel like they have been misunderstood um, their whole lives. The world doesn't really make sense to us and we also don't make sense to the world. So having a therapist or a practitioner who does understand and who really knows as much as they can know about the autistic experience is so important. And if you fail to do that, then you risk creating new parts or re-wounding old ones. So because of the way the world is set up to favor the non-autistic brain, autistic people are considered a high risk population and will often look for help. So they'll often end up in a therapy office or working, looking for IFS support. So that's something else to consider. And then when working with the IFS model and autistic clients, it's easy to confuse neurology with psychology, right? So knowing what's neurological versus knowing what's a part is vital for the therapeutic relationship to be effective. And I have a, a client that I work with. Um, he's a young male. He has issues around socializing. He's autistic and one of his issues is that when he's in company with people, if it's a small group of people that he knows, he's much more comfortable. If there are new people that he's meeting, 
he's very conscious of saying something and making a mistake, right? So not being able to read the social cues or drawing attention to himself and being called weird. So knowing his neurology is accepting that for him, reading social cues and perhaps saying things that might sound a little unusual is par for the course, right? If you're an autistic person, the likelihood of that happening is pretty high. So I don't necessarily want to work with him to change that. I want to work with him for him to understand it, right? And to see, to see how this fits into his life. But what I actually want to work with him on is the psychology of it, so the parts around it. So what parts have been created around his, his socialization? So does he have parts that feel shame or embarrassment? He certainly does. He have parts um, that shame him if he says something, if people give him too much attention and he'll withdraw from a social situation. So what you're always looking to do is to build a level of acceptance and compassion which is why it's really important for you as the therapist or practitioner to have a, at least a basic understanding of autism. So that can be your starting point, right? That's the platform from which you start your work. So then critical thinking should always be involved when you're working with any client, right? Is what I'm doing working? If so, great. If not, why not? Do I need to adjust the model in some way? Have I missed something? And then have there been moments where you're curious about some of the behaviors that you're seeing, perhaps think parts work that you're doing just isn't landing, right? So getting curious about whether there could be a neurological cause can be really helpful for a client. Okay, so a quick note on the difference between emotional dysregulation and sensory dysregulation. So sensory dysregulation can mirror emotional dysregulation in terms of how it presents. So it can look like agitation, shutdown, overwhelm, inability to concentrate. So in addition to using sensory input to perceive and understand the world around us, we use it to self-regulate. So those of us with autism have brain connections that process sensations differently and we often feel that we're being bombarded with sensory information. And then one of the other big differences is that that sensory information can stick and it can become very distracting. So for example, um, if you're in a room and there's a noise, right? Or there's somebody in the next room talking, um, you may be really good at sort of blocking that out and continuing what you're doing, whether it's engaging in a conversation or working. For someone with autism, that's going to be much harder because once that conversation that's in the next room, it lands and it's processed, it stays there and it's constantly running and the attention is drawn out and then it comes back in and then it's drawn out again. So it makes interacting with what you're doing really challenging. And in the therapeutic setting, that can be really hard and it can often look like emotional dysregulation. So you may have a client who looks like they're um, disassociating, perhaps they're shutting down, maybe they're, they seem agitated, perhaps they're not engaged in the conversation. And you might be thinking that there's an emotional component, perhaps there's a part has shown up, maybe a protector that's shutting the system down. And it could actually be that there's some sensory information coming in that's causing this disruption and this dysregulation. And that needs to be addressed first before the conversation and the work can continue. So it's just something to, to be aware of. And then just a little check-in um, that you could do either, you know, at the end of this, or you can write in the chat if you'd like to, is just consider your office, right? So what would your office be like to be, how would you experience your office if you were an autistic person, right? So how are the lights? Um, how are the chairs? Are there lots of noises? Um, is there a lot of street noise? Can you hear people in other spaces talking? Is there an air conditioner running that runs at a particular frequency? So all of these things really impact the experience, the experiences that we have, and they can certainly impact us when we're working. So I have a little case study here. So this is another client of mine. He's a 60 year old male. Um, I've been working with him for about a year. And he's fairly skilled in the practice of IFS at this point. 
and he's very good at working with his parts. He meditates, he communicates, he journals, and he has a really loving relationship with them that we've built over the course of a year. And he came to a recent session very frustrated that he had spent two weeks trying to connect to a part that was very agitated around some boxes that were on his dining room table. And he and his husband had recently sold an apartment and moved the contents of the apartment to their house. Not all of the boxes had been unpacked and some of them were lingering as they do on the table. And he came in in a in very agitated state. And I could tell from his body language um, and the language, the actual language that he was using, that, that this was really distressing to him, having these boxes on the table were really distressing him. And so he'd been trying to connect with the part um, that was so upset about the boxes being on the table. So because of the language that he was using, and because I know him, I've worked with him for a year, and because I'm autistic and my work is always informed with that lens, I just asked him if perhaps he'd ever considered that there was another another cause that perhaps there was a neurological aspect or component to this and um, when I said that his head sort of lifted and he looked at me and, and actually burst into tears um, and so I, I sat with him and held space for him and then he um, he told me that it was such a relief to hear that and that actually five years before he had gone to lunch with a friend of his that he'd been curious about whether or not he was autistic. And he'd gone to lunch with a friend of his and had asked the friend what the friend thought. And the friend's response was, oh, yes, that would make so much sense about you. And my client's response at that time, he was really hurt by that. And his response actually was, ouch, you know, that's not what I was expecting you to say. So he had parts that were created around the idea of being autistic, right? and what that means and the stigma that is attached to that and those parts shut this idea around and they packed it up and they put it away so it wasn't something that he really thought about and then the boxes right so there are always going to be you can't put autism away right you can put um, whether or not you want to face up to it whether or not you want a diagnosis how it's going to impact your life you can certainly your parts can certainly put those things away but the actual traits and characteristics, the neurology cannot be changed, right? So the boxes became a really like a key factor here. So the way he was responding to the boxes was crucial in us being able to, to sort of acknowledge this concept. So what I was able to do was to um, send him lots of resources. I have tons and tons. Uh, and I sent him to the AQ test, which is um, called the Autism Quotient Test. And it's by Simon Baron Cohen, who's one of the leading specialists in England on autism. And he designed this test to just sort of as a baseline, right, to give you an idea of whether it's a possibility. And it's 50 questions and it gives you a score at the end. And it's either no, you have no traits or you have some traits or you have significant traits. So my client took the test and actually scored that he had significant traits. Um, so then he started reading some of the books that I'd, I'd sent him um, lists of, and he spent the weekend highlighting and reading and, and things were really landing on him and helping him to make a lot of sense in terms of how he could now frame his life. And we had some great conversations about the relief that he felt um, sort of come into terms with this. And this now, this experience and this new diagnosis is going to inform our work together. So we'll be working on the parts that, that he has around being an autistic person, having always been an autistic person, but being undiagnosed. And how did that impact his experiences of the world and the parts that he created around that in order to survive and keep going? All right, so let's get into the, the meat and the bones of it, right? So how IFS can help. So I want to start out by saying that IFS works beautifully with the autistic brain. It provides a unique method and access to a rich language for describing feelings and emotional experiences. So what I mean by that is it allows the client to render a multi-dimensional connection to a part rather than focusing only on the emotions. So parts can be seen and heard before they're felt, right? 
So my non-autistic clients often struggle with the idea of parts, but for my autistic clients, most of whom are pretty pragmatic and think fairly concretely, parts make sense. And if you hear a part, you hear a part and it's unequivocal. And that can actually be really rewarding for a client who struggles with relationships um, or to develop reciprocal relationships with their own parts. It's a really beautiful thing to, to sort of go from not really knowing how to have a relationship to being able to have a relationship with your own parts and your own system. And it's so rewarding for people. So IFS helps restore the balance by creating a framework of understanding within this relationship building. And in the IFS model, clients get to use their own language, often direct and unambiguous, to connect to the parts and, des and describe their experiences. So forming their own lexicon, it builds confidence and it empowers the clients to feel that they're understood and can understand. So our own systems, as we go through this experience, our own systems begin to make sense to us and our community of parts become perhaps the first place where we've ever really felt truly accepted. And I cannot underestimate how this feels and the space that is created within the system to finally land in a place where you can accept who you are for the way you are, right? It's really an amazing experience. And uh, IFS is just an absolute gift for an autistic mind. And the IFS trained therapist or practitioner encourages the client to accept the way they experience the world as beautiful. All right, so this is a big one and I'm going to cover a lot here with self is autistic. So what do I mean by this? I mean that autism is not caused by parts. It's a neurological developmental condition that causes changes to the structures of the brain. We spoke about that at the very beginning. And those structures are primarily in the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system. So by acknowledging that self is autistic, you create an environment in which the autistic client can fully access self energy without doubting or questioning how they experience the world. This is an important and liberating experience for people. The autistic self understands, recognizes, and accepts the parts that get created around being autistic in ways that a non-autistic therapist might not. So it's like having an expert in the room. So a reluctance to acknowledge that self is autistic because of concerns around pathologizing is totally understandable. But it's important to be clear on the distinction between pathology and diagnosis. So gnosis is the Greek noun for knowing. So can this gnosis or knowing inform the therapeutic journey? And that's really the goal here, right, is how can we get the most out of this experience and the most out of this work with this particular individual? So non pathologizing carries its own risks. It doesn't account for the importance of receiving a diagnosis. So for most of us, and I talked about my own experience here, receiving a diagnosis is a huge relief. The things that we've always known about ourselves finally make sense. Diagnosis gives us a landing place and it allows us to locate ourselves on the map of a world in which we have spent much of our lives feeling lost. So if you refuse to include diagnosis or you don't understand what the diagnosis is, you minimize a lifetime of experiences and you risk losing many of the rich and wonderful details that are part of the autistic experience. And then um, during the panel that took place this morning, um, I actually covered a little bit on the panel about how the, the eight C's of self actually can look and feel a little bit different in an autistic person but the importance of accepting that self is autistic, and that's a beautiful thing. And then I found this quote, this Susan McConnell quote from a somatic IFS therapy, and it really sums up what it is about IFS that makes it so different in terms of um, relating to other therapeutic modalities and why it works so well. And uh, I was so blown away by this and how it fits with the autistic mind that I actually wrote to Susan and I asked her if she had worked with the neurodiverse population and she hasn't. And uh, she's 
really interested in it. And um, I think her and I are going to be doing some stuff together at some point. So if you have an autistic client, there's a good chance that that client has alexithymia, right? So alexithymia is a Greek word that means no words for emotions. It's a psychological construct that describes the difficulties feeling, um, identifying feelings and emotions, right? Half of all autistic people have alexithymia compared with just 5% of the population. So one of the things that you can use when you have an alexithymic client is um, in IFS, typically, we start looking for parts, right? We start looking for trailheads within the body, right? So where do you feel it? What sensations are you noticing? And we start with a very somatic-based approach. With a client who has alexithymia, you actually want to start a little bit more outside of the body or in the mind. And trailheads can begin in the mind. And starting with when the part is experienced, right? So what's the what's the trigger for the part can be just as fruitful as starting with a somatic experience in the body. And in the beginning, focusing on the part rather than on how the part shows up as an interoceptive response, right? So a feeling, it can reduce a lot of frustration and feelings of overwhelm. Um, moving inside the body can come later once a connection has been established. So IFS helps the alexithymic client by allowing them to experience parts in multi-dimensional ways. So we talked about this a little bit beforehand. So what you're doing is you're including all of the senses, right, in the experience. So you're allowing the part to speak, you're allowing it to, to hear it, you're seeing it. Um, some people have um, you know, they can taste and smell around certain experiences. And so by incorporating all of the senses, you render like a three dimensional experience, which is much easier to connect to than an emotion, which almost feels like an abstract concept. And I'm just actually going to go back to Susan's quote here, right, where she says, um, once we know it's more than a sensation or a feeling, the subpersonality takes on the impression of being a part we can relate to as a person with a history, behaviors, and hopes. And that's such a powerful thing for somebody with autism or alexithymia. So when you experience um, connecting with a part, right, you can um, connect to the experience and relay it without having to determine the emotion in the beginning. And then an IFS autism informed practitioner can help you differentiate and then help you ascribe descriptive emotion words, right? So anger, sadness, etc. So you can talk about the experience, you can watch the experience, and then you can um, work with your client to kind of formulate the language around the experience and help them understand what the emotion might have been. So Temple Grandin learned to read facial expressions by looking at photographs that had been labeled for her. So this is an angry face. This is a sad face. This is a happy face. And she took what she learned by looking at the images and then she went out into the world. And when she recognized what she was seeing, she knew what the emotion was. So the IFS process does the same thing for an alexithymic client or a client who is sort of um, disconnected from their emotional world or their feelings um, for whatever reason and it helps them learn and remember how anger or sadness or happiness looked and felt so they have the image of the client they have this beautiful multi-dimensional model that they can relate to and they can remember what that looks like and then the, the therapist can help them with the language around that and then that becomes their they're a mirror, so to speak, for if, if that is happening again, then they can say, okay, well, I remember this experience and it's anger. So it's a really incredible way to help build language and help build interoception. Masking. Masking is really common. In fact, I have never yet met an autistic person who hasn't masked or doesn't mask. Um, mask is entirely parts driven. And it's driven by parts that want to conform and belong, who don't want to have too much attention given to them. 
And these parts can be managers, firefighters or exiles. Um, so managers sometimes mask to make sure that we stay functioning at high levels, um, that we're successful at work. Firefighters can mask to avoid um, being seen or bullied. They can put us in situations that can cause overwhelm and that can then um, that can then turn into other shaming parts being created around that. And then parts can certainly be exiled around masking. You know, perhaps we weren't good enough at masking and attention was drawn to us and something bad happened as a result. So masking is a very common reason for autistic burnout. And um, autistic burnout is basically being overwhelmed and exhausted by the sheer effort that it takes to fit into the world, right? So this is why this idea of being high functioning, it just really needs to go because there's no such thing as high functioning, right? So perhaps you're more verbal, perhaps you're, you know, I don't know, perhaps you're better at social communication, but there is a, there's a huge amount of effort that it takes to get through every day as an autistic person, right? Just it's a volume of processing and then there's the emotional component and that can really cause, um, it can cause real issues and um, burnout is really common and burnout can be, you know, needing to take days off. It can go to weeks, months or even years. So it's something to really pay attention to. So what we're looking to do is to build a world where we don't need to mask or where we at least can limit our masking because we're accepted, we're not stigmatized and we're not judged. And then one other note is that masking behaviors are much more common in females than in males, um, which isn't really surprising due to the societal constraints on women that men don't really have. Okay, so we're coming to the end. So I want to just talk briefly about legacy burdens and blessings. So if you're fortunate enough to have come from a family where your autistic traits were explained to you, where they were welcomed and encouraged, um, like the nature writer, Dara McAnulty, I don't know if any of you have ever read his book. He's pretty amazing. He's a young man from Northern Ireland. Your legacy includes many blessings if you grow up that way, right? So you have gifts. And these gifts are part of your autistic experience and they're something to be celebrated and they become a blessing that you can carry throughout your life. And those blessings inform and in inspire your experience and they can help you find a home for all the corners and edges that separate us from everybody else. For others, the legacy is an emotional fractal that repeats and repeats through generations. So the historical narrative of autism is a painful one. It includes concentration camps, eugenics, institutions, um, shaming, stigmatizing, loneliness. So there's, there's a, a very painful um, history to being an autistic person. And the idea that we're somehow less than, that we're broken in some way has informed the social and psychological discourse of the autistic experience for a really long time now. So when I asked my friends and family, um, I think it was last year, perhaps at the beginning of this year, if I should admit to being autistic on my website, so if I should put something on my website, they all told me no. And um, I fully understand that their reaction came from a very loving place, right? They were trying to protect me from failure, perhaps, or humiliation. But their response was no, because if you do that, nobody's going to want to work with you. And that's because of the stigma around being autistic. It's not what my friends and family think, but their concern was that other people in the world think that, and that if I admit to being autistic, I'm not going to have any clients and my business is going to tank. So interestingly, the opposite has happened. And by being an authentically autistic person, I've actually um, been able to reach and help a lot of people. And I work with clients from all around the world, from every country, well, not every country, but from countries on every continent. Um, and it's really beautiful work to do. So there's a very common discourse there. But that the, I, the um, decision for them to tell me, no, don't do it, right that decision came from this historical narrative around autism so many autistic clients myself included 
particularly adults who are newly diagnosed, carry heavy burdens of shame and are often reluctant to be open about their diagnosis. Others, like my mother, remain undiagnosed but impacted by their autism their whole lives. So this is a picture of my mum at the age of 15 at the approved school where she was sent to. And um, you can see the date, 1961. So as I do this work and I try and get my message out into the world, I hold in my mind the experiences of my mother. The damage that was done to her during this period of her life never left her. It filled her with shame and the belief that she could not be loved, even by her children. The weight of that landed on me and my siblings, and it disrupted our entire childhood, and it robbed us of the safety and warmth of parental love. So now I'm handing a new legacy to my daughter and to others like me. And it states that there's a beauty to the way we think and experience the world and that the view from where we sit is a perfectly fine one. And I offer that to all of you. And thank you so much for listening. So I did it. Goodness. Thank you so much for all being here. Um, Megan, how much time do we have for questions? There's about 14 minutes left. Okay. Yeah. So if anybody, um, are they, can people unmute themselves or? Yeah, it's up to you. There's also a few questions in the Q&A box if you wanted to answer those. Yeah, uh, I've been trying to unmute. follow those, but it's, uh, it's hard to sort of read them and then engage with people. But if anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask a question, you're certainly welcome to. Um, we can allow those who have their hand raised to talk and they can unmute. We can go through that. Yeah, we'll start with Claire, Claire, De, right. Claire Von Thanks, de Bosch, if you can unmute. Oh, she lowered her hand. So we will okay. we'll go to Tony. <laughs> Tony, if you can unmute. No, I wonder if people aren't able to unmute, maybe. They should have that system setting. It might be. Okay. Zoom related. All right, um, it seems they can't. So, all right, I'll go into the Q&A and I'll see. Um, all right, I see. Uh, there's, there's definitely been, I want to just, um, this question came up a lot and I want to just answer this because it's really lovely that this is coming up, that what do you do if you have a client and you suspect that they have ASD and they don't necessarily know that and how should you approach that as the therapist or practitioner working with them? So firstly, thank goodness for you, right? And that you're paying that kind of attention to your clients that you're starting to recognize these things. So that's a really amazing thing. I always float it. Um, the client that I used in the case study, I floated it with him, you know, on and off, probably three or four different times over the course of the year and was shut down every single time until that last time when it became so apparent that um, I really sort of held a little bit more space and, and sort of stood and said, listen, I really think that maybe we should consider this. So I would start very gently, right? Um, lots of self-energy for you holding space for the parts of them that are going to come up. There are enormous feelings around this for clients. Um, I had a consult with a man today who's 71 years old, who was diagnosed last year. And as he was telling me his story, um, he was in tears because he'd lived 70 years as an undiagnosed autistic person. He was bullied in school, he was beaten up in school. He was labeled, he was, and it's affected every aspect of his life. And at the age of 71, he finally has a diagnosis and his life makes sense to him now, right? So be prepared for all kinds of parts to come up around that. You may find resistance when you first start to discuss it. You're going to have exiles 
you're going to have firefighters, you're going to have um, the parts that have been masking. All of those parts are going to need to be held really gently. Overall, the good news is that almost everyone, and again, I'm, I really don't mean to generalize here at all, um, almost everyone comes to a point of, wow, this is life-changing for me because all of the things I thought that were wrong with me my whole life, they now make sense. And I can exist in this world with all of my edges and my corners and it doesn't matter, right? And it just changes everything and it creates so much space. So just go gently, float the ideas. There are resources in the handouts. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the chat, so it's a little distracting. Uh, there's a whole list of resources in the handouts for you. And you can contact me, you can email me, you can call me. This is like, this is what I do. So I'm totally open to anyone who needs any, um, any help and support, okay? So feel free to get in touch. Um, it's really hard for me to follow all this written stuff. I'm so sorry. I, I wish I could. Would you that. like me to read one for you? I have. That would be amazing. Thank here. you. Yeah. So a question from Risa. Can you say more about the distinction of self as autistic versus a system being autistic or self being embodied in an autistic system? Yeah. So for me, it's a way to really embrace a diagnosis of autism. Right. Um, it takes a lot of courage to seek a diagnosis. And it takes work as an adult who's lived an undiagnosed life to come to terms with what that means and to all of the, the factors of your life that didn't make sense, all the issues, um, traumas, shame, legacy burdens, everything that goes along with that. How can we be respectful of that if we then say to the client, you know, you're, you're like, you're partly autistic, but yourself isn't autistic, your parts are autistic. So I'm just not interested in that. For me personally, I fully believe that self is autistic. It's a neurological condition. The shape and structure of, of my brain is different to the shape and structure of the brain of someone who doesn't have autism. Therefore, my, the starting point of self energy is going to be as an autistic person. And the reason it's important to know that is because self in an autistic person doesn't necessarily look like self in a person who doesn't have autism, right? So maybe you have a client who's voice prosody, right? Which is a diagnostic criteria. Maybe their voice prosody is, is different. Maybe they, they speak in very short sentences. I have a 14 year old boy that I work with. Every question, it's a yes or no, that's it. It's a yes or no. But I've worked with him to know, you know, when he is feeling in that place of self in terms of when he feels content and when he feels calm. So use the characteristics of self to guide you as opposed to, um, you know, what you're hearing um, and what you're seeing, right? So it really is about like learning your client's autistic profile, which if you work with autistic people is a really great thing to do. It's easy to do. You sit down with them, you work out um, what their strengths are, the things that impact them, what their sensory needs are, what their comforts are. And um, it will just give you insights into how they respond to you and what things make them feel calm and centered and content. I love the word content because that's a big one, right? If you're at peace, you're content, you have access to self-energy. Is there another question? Okay. Yeah, we have another one um, from Max. It says, in the past, I've supervised an autistic therapist I noticed and noticed my own parts were activated hearing of his relational slash social missteps with clients that he sometimes was aware mm -hmm. of and sometimes was not. How might you have approached the situation? Yeah, well, as somebody who makes constant social missteps, um, I always sit in those places from with so much compassion. Um, so just, you know, noticing your parts is really great. And that's always the first step, right? And then get curious, like, why are your parts coming up around that, around his social missteps? What are you noticing, right? What is it about his experience that's landing on you? And in this way, you know, working with an autistic client is the same as a non-autistic client. The more self-energy that you have as a therapist or practitioner, the better the work will be. The quality of the work, the, the feel of the work, the depth of the work, the width of the work, everything will land better 
if you have access to self-energy, but noticing your parts is a great starting place. Okay. And another question says, do you find that many autistic people can differentiate between sensory slash neurological over overstimulation versus emotional? Well, that's a great question. Um, it depends what their knowledge of autism is. Um, if they're newly diagnosed and they're on the learning curve, that might be more challenging. And um, that's why an autistic profile is something that's really handy to have um, for them to have also. Um, you know, in the case study I used, he had no idea that the boxes, the disturbance in his personal environment, which is a sensory issue, was causing his dysregulation. So some of this is, is sort of like, um, you know, it's like you're on a treasure hunt, right? And you're looking to see what's impacting your client and why. Some people do know, I know, I know what my sensory issues are for sure. And I have my environment set up as much as I can to avoid those. Um, other clients, they may not have the awareness. If you know that you're working with a client with ASD, you can ask them. I really recommend just having an open dialogue about how their autism shows up in their life. It's totally personal. It impacts everyone differently. So just have the dialogue, let them tell you what their sensory needs are. And then from there, you can be a partner in their journey to discover, you know, where their dysregulation is coming from. Beautiful. And we might just have time, maybe one or two more. Uh, do you have any recommendations for how adult individuals who are seeking a diagnosis can be assessed? I live in a state where therapists or counselors are not permitted to diagnose. Yes. So I'm a huge proponent in um, starting with self-diagnosis. I think it's really valuable. That's where I started. The AQ test is one of my go-tos as a baseline, right? If you don't have any autistic characteristics or traits, you're going to score really low on an AQ test. So if you start scoring on, an, on the AQ test and you're hitting, you know, like 27 and up, it's a, it's a good clue that you, that you have some traits and characteristics. Um, in the handouts, there's a whole list of resources and tests that you can do. And then you can look at the reason why you want a formal diagnosis, right? Are you look, um, hoping to get services? Do you want to get disability? Is it impacting your life that you need those services? Um, if it doesn't, you can get curious about your parts, right? I've had clients say to me, well, um, no one's going to believe me if I don't have a formal diagnosis, right? So that's parts work. So you work with the part that wants the formal diagnosis to see why they want the formal diagnosis. And if they really need it, then it's totally fine. You can look at, look for um, psychologists and things in terms of the, the state rules and laws. I don't know, I'm afraid. Um, I don't know how that would work. If you'd have to go to a psychologist, I guess a clinical psychologist would diagnose, um, but use the, use the testing that's available online. It's really accurate. They're tests that are written by highly thought of people. It's not, you know, it's not just your neighbor who's come up with a test and then put it out on I don't know, TikTok or something. They're, you know, these are, these are good clinical baseline tests. Great information to have to start with. Okay, we just have a couple minutes more. Do you wanna do one more question? Yeah, You're sorry. Not, one more, that's okay. See, this is what happens to me. <laughs> that's totally fair. It's a lot. There's a lot of questions and I'll see what we can do about getting these questions in the materials and the answers that you've, you've typed in from earlier in the session. Um, this one last question, I hope it's not too big, but um, it's been uploaded a couple of times. When going inside with the six Fs, I'm wondering if there are considerations for reframing the Fs, such as how do you feel toward keeping alexithymia in mind? Oh, lovely question. Thank you for asking this. Yes, definitely. Um, and this is something that I'm hoping to work with Susan McConnell about, right, the somatic stuff. And her book actually is really great for working with autistic clients. Just a little note there. So if somebody's having trouble feeling, don't start there, right? Ask them what the trigger was. That's my favorite question for ASD clients. What happened? What happened that made this part become active? What did this part say? Right? What sorts of things did this part say to you? And someone else in the Q and A wrote, um, you know, what? How do you um, look for self, like the feel toward question, right? To to gather whether or not there's self energy. Just don't use it. 
you could say, um, instead of saying, how do you feel towards this part? You could say, is there anything you'd like to say to this part, right? And if the client says, um, no, I wish this part wasn't here, you know, it's not self energy. If the client says, you know, maybe I feel bad for the part, could be compassion, right? Again, we've got to have some leeway with some wiggle room with the language around this, right? We have to be flexible with the thinking and the language around this. Um, so yes, be prepared to take the six Fs and make them yours. And I'm actually currently working on these, you know, the six Fs and the eight Cs. And I think that's that's the, mo the main ones. And I'm trying to sort of change them to fit the autistic brain. And I'll let you guys know when when there are, I'll stick them up on my website once I have them done. So, and for anyone else, um, I do offer workshops and I also do um, trainings for group practices. So if you work in a group practice and you have a bunch of therapists um, and they don't know how to look for these things, please let me know and I'm happy to, to talk to you guys and give you some more information of how to do it because the work is a gift and we need it. Beautiful. And with, with that, we are at time today. Thank you so much. We'll make yeah. sure we try to get Thank the chat you. for everyone and the resources and the questions, the many that you answered during the recording. Um, thank you yeah, so much, thanks Sarah. Everyone. I really appreciate everyone's attention and being engaged. It's nice, all those thank yous. How lovely is that? And thanks, Sarah, for your help, and you too, Megan. Yeah, and we know it can feel abrupt when we end, so we'll just make sure we say goodbye to everybody. Thank yeah, you. And all these thank yous coming. Yeah, take care, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>